sir uh, good morning shrinivas sir sir uh, good morning am i audible yes yeah, sir you are audible yeah very good morning uh, sir um, uh, good morning mahender sir sir good morning sir good morning teja uh, shall we start sir yeah sir you are you, you will be taking the first session or uh, no uh, we we have divided our presentation into two parts so okay. first part on tsunami warning system and uh, tsunami modeling dr shiva srinivas uh, who has already joined the meeting he will uh, take the next i will follow him okay sir sure sir uh uh, okay, uh, Teja, I have a small issue here. Uh, so I don't have uh, my suddenly my uh, mic and video is giving a trouble in my PC. So what okay. has happened is I have logged in mobile for audio and video, and for presentation I have logged in uh, PC. But I think so I'm, no unable to, I'm unable to weave in both. Uh, I'm unable to log in, I guess. Uh, sir, you can do one thing, sir. You can join with the panel. Uh, you know, we are uh, videos have a problem, sir. Uh, my uh, PC video has a problem. Okay, so, I agree. okay, no issue. Uh, I connected, but I think it is throwing me out. Okay. Because uh, only... Can you do one thing, sir? I will share one uh, link with you. Like, I will okay. share the link with Mandar, sir. Okay. So, okay. Join, uh, join with that link. Then after, I will make you the panelist. Uh, no, I have no, joined through a panelist. No, no, I will give that uh, attend attendee link for you. Then after, I will make you panelist. Oh, fine okay uh, i think i have got the uh, uh, attendee link as well i have joined through panelist only from uh, both uh, pieces but i'm exiting out after logging in okay fine uh, do it fine uh, we have actually we have a four here for which pc i have to give a, a sharing of uh, option mm. okay. i have actually four here oh i have logged in uh, four times you mean uh -huh. Four times. Three times in mobile, three times in PC. Uh, okay, you uh, close the, uh, you keep in the first one, but uh, unable yes, to sir. see in PC. Uh, I have logged in, but I am unable to see the uh, portal in PC. It is logging me out. Okay, can you do one thing, sir? You can log out all the devices except the mobile. Okay, okay. sir. Okay, uh, I, will send, uh, I will send one link to Mahendra sir. Mahendra sir will share it to you. So you can log in with that click. Then after okay. you let me know. So I will make you fine. panelist. Fine, fine, teacher. Sorry. You log out from all the pieces. Yeah, no issue, sir. This always, yeah. Yeah, always happens. Sharing the link with Mahendra sir. Okay. Mahendra sir, I have already shared the link with you, so please. Yeah, I'll forward it to you. Yes. Yes. Okay, sir. Shivashrinivas, yes, I sent you uh, yes, WhatsApp. Uh, WhatsApp, you should have sent me in uh, a mail, sir. Mail, huh? Ah, because it's in a PC, right? Suddenly, uh, my PC started giving hands since morning. I have restarted, but uh... it's okay, sir. Uh, dear participants, uh, good morning, all. Uh, uh, we will be joining our session within a couple of minutes. There is uh, some technical issues with uh, uh, Srinivasar system. Uh, we will uh, back uh, within uh, two minutes. Yes. Sir, mind, uh, mind, sir, you have forwarded me to email. Thank you. 
a safely under the table. Now, I was standing in Jack and Drop to not light the back step over your mouth to the clock. Tap and or all. Shut away. You stand and not minutes or elevators. And state options. Be cautious and check why stable objects are wrong. Be smart. Be nimble. మీరు <laughs> And Tarun, this share option is not enabled for us to share PPT. Uh, that I enabled you over share button, sir. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, Teja, it says uh, already you are in the event. Uh, yes. So they say join again. Uh, okay, uh, in the panel, in the attorney list, sir. Uh, it says you are already in the event. Uh, the link which you have sent to Mahindra, sir, I have uh, clicked on the link. So if I say join uh, event, I'll be, uh, I'll be yeah, able sir, to log you in. Now, you, are, you, are, you are now in the list. Uh, but uh, what I suspect is after some time, it will throw me out. No, no, sir. Uh, you just check in now, sir. I have make you panelist. Uh, we, assist you, uh, we have a one, two, three, four, four, four logins actually. So, which PC uh, I should give a share button access? Mahindra, can you come here? Yeah, I, I'll go to Mahindra, sir, uh, place and, and then I'll talk from there. I think that would be better. Sir, yes, sir. Okay, sir, right. Mahindra, sir, how are you, sir? Yeah. Sorry, it's okay, it's okay. So these are the technical uh, uh, glitches will be there. You know, no problems. <clears throat> So meanwhile, uh, I will start the event, sir. Yeah, you can. Uh, namaste. Good morning, all. On behalf of NIDA, I go Gunda Gautam Krishna Teja, Jun Consultant for GIS and EOC, welcomes you all to the third day of three days online training program on remote sensing applications in disaster risk management, organized by National Institute of Disaster Management. Before we start our OTP, I would like to convey my sincere thanks to Srita Jason, IPS ED, and uh, Professor Suryaprakash, head, Chema Edition, and CBRN 
Industrial and Cyber DR Division, NIDM, Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India, Delhi, for giving this opportunity to conduct these three days online training program. So without let, I will quickly recapitulate the uh, hello, first teacher. and second day's technical issue. Hello. Sessions. Ah, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Hello. Sir, you are audible, sir. Hello. Yes, sure. Sure. Hello. 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 Sir, you are audible, sir. Hello, am I audible? Hello. Yeah, you are audible, sir. So otherwise, I can start with my presentation before he comes. Uh, sure, sir. We can do that. Uh, so, so without late, I will quickly recapitulate the first and second days of technical sessions. On first day, Dr. Pravin Gupta, head land hydrology division at Space Application Center, is so Ahmedabad delivered a session on flood satellite observations and modeling, followed by Dr. Bipasa Paul Shukla, scientist, SG. Atmospheric Science Division, Atmospheric and Ocean Sciences Group, Space Application Center, ISRO, delivered a session on satellite based snow casting of extreme events. On second day, Dr. K.K. Sharma, at present working as a group head of Remote Sensing Application Center Group at Northeastern Space Application Center, delivered a session on geospatial technology in disaster risk management, and followed by Dr. Digant Parman, Division Head, Water Resource, NISAC. Third session on geospatial applications in flood and river bank erosion management. So, dear participants, please note that you have a, you can source your questions queries in chat box as well as the question and answer section. And also, please make sure that you attend and pay attention to the sessions to claim the certificate from the NIDM training portal after this OTP. So, without it, I'd like to introduce our first speaker to our audience, Mr. Mahindra RS has completed his uh, master degree in geoinformatics in 2002 from Mangalore University. Earlier in 20, 2000, he obtained a master degree in marine geology from Mangalore University. Subsequently, he worked at Karnataka Space Remote Center, Bangalore, India, as project scientist during 2003 2005. Later, he joined INCOIS, Ministry of Air Science, as a project scientist to be in 2005. Since then he is working in INCOIS and currently working as an scientist E at INCOIS India. He has over 19 years of experience in the field of coastal geospatial applications. He has accomplished national projects on coastal vulnerability index mapping, multi hazard vulnerability mapping, 3D GIS mapping, and coral ecomorphology mapping. He is also responsible for implementation of coral beaching alert system at INCOIS. He has more than 30 publications in referred journals and more than 30 papers presented in the conferences. Besides, he is also instrumental in finalizing of two atlas on culture vulnerability. He was a resource person for GI sources conducted under IODE and temp training programs of IOTWMS of ICO UNICEF. With this, I like to invite Mr. Mandar Kumar sir. Yeah, thank you, Teja. So, yeah, the floor is yours now, sir. Yeah, wonderful introduction. So, sorry, viewers, for technical puzzle. Uh, uh, we will start uh, initially. I will present on vulnerability mapping. Later, my colleague, uh, Shiv Dr. Shiva Srinivas, will present on the tsunami inundation modeling uh, aspects. So, I'll okay. share my presentation. So, can you able to view my presentation? Yes, sir. Yeah. So I uh, basically talk on the coastal multi hazard vulnerability assessment uh, uh, from the perspective of INCAIS. So these activities are widely based on the remote sensing and uh, GS applications. Basically, we use geospatial applications. So we all know that climate is changing, and uh, 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 as a result of that, uh, heat content in the sea is increasing, and the uh, as a resultant, sea levels are rising. So these rising sea level can exacerbate the existing problem like uh, uh, tsunami, storm surge, and other uh, coastal inundation activities. So it is clearly evident that uh, global temperatures are rising. So as a result of uh, carbon uh, emission, 
and uh, sea levels are rising and uh, in addition to that uh, glacials also glaciers in the uh, polar region and other mountain regions are melting and uh, as a result of that sea levels are uh, rising due to steric and non-steric effect so another one activity is the heat once the global temperature is increased where that actually heat go 84 percent of the heat is consumed by the ocean uh, water because uh, two-third of the uh, earth surface is covered by oceans as a result of uh, heat content is rising in the sea uh, that gives rise to a sea level rise and uh, you all know that uh, what all the component of uh, 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 thermal expansion like uh, due to heat what is the contribution of the sea level rise there is 1.3 millimeter per year is giving rise and uh, glacial melt will give 0.65 and uh, greenland gas antarctica and arctic other residual uh, uh, ice melts are giving rise to the uh, mean sea level uh, rise along the uh, world oceans so for an example i give you this bar diagram uh, like suppose the entire antarctican ice melts that gives rise to a sea level rise of about 70 meters. This is just for your understanding what is the significance of sea level rise uh, can make on uh, coastal uh, uh, environments and how it can uh, potentially threat uh, coastal zones uh, so that, that can experience inundation in the coming uh, uh, century. So this is a glimpse what is the implication of climate change uh, on uh, sea level, uh, global sea level rise. So there is an another uh, study by uh, uh, study also says that IPCC there is a uh, continuous sea levels are rising and in the recent uh, uh, past there is a sea level rise you can, this is a linear uh, sea level rise and uh, uh, there are different uh, uh, trends obtained till 1920.8 millimeter per year and uh, between 20 to 1985 there is a sea level rise of uh, uh, 0.2 millimeter and based on our recent altimetric assessment the sea level rise are uh, estimated 3.2 millimeter per year so we can understand how the sea level trends were uh, totally uh, uh, change in the trends in the recent past in the past two decades uh, average mean sea level rise is 3.2 millimeter per year from one 0.8 to 3.2 millimeter per year it was uh, increased over a period of uh, past uh, century so there is another study by uh, the ipcc uh, assessment report six uh, they have come out with a different uh, uh, scenarios uh, suppose say uh, uh, there will be a, a sea level rise of uh, 0.28 to 0.55 meter under the low emission scenario of uh, sp ssp one of 1.9 and mod under moderate scenario, sea level would be raised from 0.44 meter to 0.76 meter. And, and very high scenario, it may go more than one meter as well in the next 100 years. These are the scenarios uh, uh, for the global uh, sea level rise uh, assessment was carried out by uh, IPCC. And uh, beyond doubt, uh, there is a, an increased sea level rise that definitely have an implication on the coastal zones. And uh, we should consider sea level is an important parameter while uh, uh, carrying out the coastal uh, inundation or coastal vulnerability assessments okay so this is a uh, study carried out by uh, mois uh, uh, iit in pune and uh, they have uh, uh, estimated the what is the uh, time series global heat content anomaly in the indian ocean and you can see that clearly there is an increased uh, heat content anomaly uh, uh, post uh, uh, 2000 uh, onwards. There is an increased ton and overall there is an uh, sea level rise, especially the uh, sea level increase, sea level uh, uh, global uh, heat content is observed in the Indian Ocean as well. So impact of climate change on Indian Ocean has been was also carried out and it was observed that uh, sea, sea level trend during ultimate uh, period like after 1993 uh, onwards, uh, the increased uh, sea level rise was observed about, a point, uh, about 5 mm per year, especially in the northern Bay of Bengal has recorded highest uh, uh, sea level rise. There is an example of sea level rise recorded by different uh, tidal gas stations were also presented here, Mumbai, Kochi, Vaisag and Kolkata. So about 10 to 30 centimeters of sea level rise was uh, recorded during the period of 1952 to 2015. 
So and another study, case study uh, was carried out based on the altimetric data. Uh, pre-2004 and post-2004, there are different uh, trends are depicted in the uh, uh, Indian Ocean. Uh, we have carried out four scenarios for entire Indian Ocean, Northern Indian Ocean, Arabian Sea and uh, Bay of Bengal. These are the four uh, scenarios, out of which Northern uh, 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 Bay of Bengal has recorded highest uh, uh, rate of uh, 7.5 uh, millimeter uh, per year plus or minus 0.73 uh, per year was recorded. So these there is no uh, these are also giving a, a vital information because altimeters uh, on board the satellites record continuous uh, sea levels and based on that we can calculate the trend. So another uh, uh, study based on uh, tide gauge records also we were carried out. So we have, uh, thanks to Survey of India, which is an oldest uh, survey institute in the world, they uh, installed uh, tide gas stations uh, along the Indian coast. And uh, we have very uh, uh, large data sets available for few station, Mumbai, uh, Kochi, and other uh, stations. More than 100 years of data is available. Initially, the, though these, was, uh, these stations were uh, uh, installed for the uh, navigation purpose, uh, later, due to these climate change and other things, they this uh, sea level data has gained important and widely used for the uh, estimation of uh, sea level trend. So we can uh, we have estimated sea level trend based on the tide gauge record for various uh, stations. Suppose say for Mumbai, we have recorded 1.2 millimeter per year, and uh, Kochi 1.75, Vaisak 1.9, uh, and Diamond Harbor is highest 5.74 millimeter per year uh, based on these tide gauge records. Even tide gauge records also reveal that there is an increased sea level rise in the recent past and uh, there is a, a, a serious concern uh, for uh, uh, the coastal authorities to assess and uh, make uh, uh, well uh, prepared measures so sea levels are rising at a rate of 0.3 uh, to 0.5 millimeter per year only over a period of uh, next 100 years it may be 30 to 50 centimeter how does it matters so, but sea level alone may not have uh, significant uh, impact on the coast, but it can exacerbate the existing problem in the future. We can see that due to climate change, there is an increased hydrometeorological events, the frequency and intensity. There is a bar diagram, you can see this. Green is meteorological and uh, uh, dark green is the hydrological events. The frequency, and, uh, frequency of these events were increased over a period. Uh, and, uh, in addition to that, there will be an increased uh, uh, heat wave uh, conditions and extreme cold wave conditions as well. So, as a, in a nutshell, uh, these implications will affect the uh, country in a, on a large uh, this one. Their uh, GDP will be affected because this is one such estimate by uh, US uh, saying that over a period of 1980 to 2012, what is the losses incurred by US due to these uh, uh, hazards? So you can say that uh, average number of uh, dollars uh, due to damage events and what is the consequence uh, uh, economical loss due to these disasters. So it's very important to uh, assess these uh, uh, implications of these uh, sea level rise and coastal hazards in a scientific and systematic manner. And uh, in our, why the, the oceans are very important and not only uh, due to these resources, it will also have a uh, vital uh, um, uh, uh, strategic place and transport medium and large coastal densely populated uh, coastal uh, uh, population depend on various uh, oceanographic resources uh, for trade other things so th that's why it's important to make a systematic assessment uh, uh, of uh, coastal ocean to make a systematic ass assessments we need to understand the dynamical process of the oceans so ocean is a dynamic uh, uh, in nature it contains lot of uh, uh, internal uh, physical biological and geological process within it on top of it uh, atmospheric also interact with the ocean and in addition to that uh, when, it, when it comes to the coast there are a lot of uh, terrigenous or uh, land derived processes also interact with these uh, ocean uh, parameters hence we need to have a uh, systematic uh, uh, assessment of these oceanic uh, phenomena uh, what is the kind of uh, disaster can be generated what is the origin of genesis and what kind of uh, impact on the coastal zone it can uh, make so for to understand these uh, ocean dynamic process of the ocean uh, remote sensing plays a vital role there are several and uh, several uh, remote sensing satellites uh, revolving around the earth and they provide uh, 
they, they uh, on board various uh, uh, sensors like radiometers, multimeter, scatter meter, and synthetic aperture radars. <coughs> and these uh, sensors providing vital information, which can help us to understand the ocean oceanographic phenomena, the parameters such as uh, sea surface temperature, ocean color, and uh, wind speed, and uh, uh, sea, sea surface height, and various other parameters. Even you can also uh, study on the cryosphere, sphere, what is the uh, uh, polar ice content, what is the how, how glaciers are depleting. All these uh, phenomena can be studied uh, pertaining to the uh, ocean and land as well. So, especially for oceanographic study, we have OceanSat 1, 2, and recently, a uh, couple of days back, Ocean, uh, OceanSat 3 was also launched. It has on board uh, uh, ocean color monitor, uh, sea surface temperature, and uh, scatterometer as well. So these uh, remote sensing satellites provide a vital information on uh, uh, analyzing the ocean, uh, extracting the oceanic parameter, and those will help us to understand the various oceanographic phenomena. In addition to that, we also have various uh, uh, sensors which are installed in the sea, because INCAIS is a kind of a, uh, uh, um, the marine data center, we post a lot of marine you know, oceanographic data on our uh, uh, da website and uh, on our servers. We continuously monitor the ocean seas through these sensors. We have cargo floats, uh, moor buoys, drifting buoys, XBTs, and current meters. So we also have a tide gauges and a deep ocean tsunami buoys also available, coastal radars, seismic networks, uh, and uh, uh, ship mounted automatic weather stations. And we also have wave radar buoys to measure the continuous wave activity and we also have a ocean going as research vessels with us for specific purpose we conduct a lot of cruises to collect various oceanographic parameters uh, we recently uh, um, we recently acquired uh, gliders it's a kind of a, a remote uh, vehicle we can mount uh, various uh, sensors on that and we can collect a specific uh, parameters along the track uh, uh, by guiding uh, these gliders. So these remote sensing and in situ data uh, will provide a vital information. These are the constellation of the uh, uh, observatories uh, along the, uh, in the Indian Ocean, uh, different uh, sensors and uh, where, where all these located. So these data will be continuously reporting to INCOIS and uh, this data along with remote sensing data, um, the scientists at INCOIS are uh, uh, acquiring and uh, these data will be processed and quality checked. Once data is in a usable form, our modeling team will uh, uh, assimilate all these uh, data into their uh, modeling uh, system and simulate the various ocean phenomena such as uh, waves, significant wave height, what is the wave height uh, expected for next five days. We can also keep forecast waves, currents, uh, uh, thermocline depth and various other parameters you are uh, simulated using the modeling uh, uh, activity. We have uh, uh, dedicated uh, modeling team which they use as uh, various models like Wayowatch, Mike and Roams uh, and uh, uh, for coastal purpose we use uh, uh, Mike uh, and we also have a location specific uh, modeling team which gives us a very uh, well added and high resolution uh, modeling uh, outputs as well. So these will also provide an vital input for our coastal uh, uh, vulnerability and other assessments as well. Now coming to the actual topic, uh, we all know that the uh, coastal zones of India are uh, uh, exposed to natural environment. So they are, there are a lot of uh, large low-lying areas are associated with the uh, Indian coast, especially if you come to the east coast. East coast has a last, larger exposure to these oceanic, oceanic hazards as they are more uh, low-lying and uh, deltaic environment associated with the low-lying. So we also know that there is a 13% of the world's uh, cyclones were generated in the Bay of Bengal. Uh, that is the one more threat. And we also have an episodic uh, uh, tsunami event, although they are rare, but their impacts are very devastating. And uh, in addition to that, continuously rising sea levels also there. And we also observed that there is an increased frequency in the uh, tropical cyclones as well. We will uh, notice back-to-back uh, -back cyclones in the Bay of Bengal. Now, even uh, Arabian Sea also not safe from the cyclones. Earlier, cyclones were less in the Arabian Sea. Now, the cyclone uh, uh, repetitivity is also increased in the uh, uh, Arabian Sea as well due to the uh, marine heat waves are getting increased and uh, there are conditions which 
can also uh, translate the cyclones into Arabic Sea as well. So uh, uh, we have conducted what is the frequency based on the available uh, sea level data. We have the what is the frequency of the uh, sea level rise of more than 0.5, uh, uh, which exceeds 0.5 meter uh, in the uh, along the Indian coast. We see that uh, very high frequency uh, events are uh, expected in the northern Bay of Bengal and Gujarat. Uh, this will give kinds of this will give a kind of overall scenario on what is the uh, vulnerability condition or the uh, flooding uh, scenario of the uh, Indian coast as well. So if you come to the right side, this is a coastal uh, erosion. This is carried out based on the uh, long-term uh, uh, remote sensing data. And you can also highlight what all the coastal areas which are under the erosion, very high erosion, moderate and low erosion. So these are the parameters can be derived using the uh, remote sensing and uh, observation data and a lot of GIS applications also used in the background. So look at the uh, characteristics of each of these uh, coastal hazards, like I give a few examples like uh, tsunami, storm surge, uh, high waves and uh, sea level rise. So what is their uh, frequency and uh, impact and likely to be affected, what is the extent and potential warning time. If you take tsunami, tsunami is a kind of a, a rare event, it takes decades to millennium to happen. That is the kind of repetitivity tsunami will have. And what is the impact? It will observe initial drawdown and later there will be a huge wall of air will come and hit the coast so it can inundate the coastal uh, uh, zones uh, uh, up to uh, several kilometers as well and the response time for tsunami will be a uh, few minutes to the few hours only that is the response time within that uh, the entire warning and uh, evacuation uh, measures has to be taken because that's how uh, our preparedness should be if you take a storm surge, storm surge will be taking months to decades uh, in a repetitivity and this is also a catastrophic event. This is also flooding the coastal areas. But storm surge will have few hours to few days as well. You can predict in three, four days or five days in advance as well. So extreme uh, wind waves also will be similar to storm surges. Whereas if you take sea level rise, sea level rise, we cannot really perceive uh, in a uh, open eye. It's a continuous uh, phenomena. And uh, uh, the really that impact of uh, sea level rise can be uh, perceived in the decades to uh, century uh, time scales. So we, we need to have, <coughs> we need to have a kind of an uh, holistic approach to combine all these hazards into a single uh, uh, method and come out with a uh, uh, composite scenario of coastal zones which are affected by these multiple hazards. So for all this purpose, we have uh, uh, geospatial technology that provides a vital uh, role in uh, synthesizing these large uh, oceanographic data, remote sensing data, and generating them into a meaningful uh, maps which are useful for the disaster management. So finally, to understand vulnerability, we need to know what is the exposure, sensitivity, what is the kind of potential impact. Uh, once you know the impact, uh, that will tell us the uh, phys physical vulnerability. Once you know the physical vulnerability, you would also uh, need to know, uh, estimate what are the vulnerable elements within that hazard zone and what is the adaptive use of capacity as well as sensitivity of those uh, uh, coastal vulnerable elements. Based on that, we can come out with the vulnerability maps. So this, these such maps will be helpful for the coastal disaster management. So to achieve all these uh, objectives of uh, generating vulnerability map, right from the data analysis to uh, end uh, map generation, geospatial technology provides a vital opportunity. A uh, lot of uh, remote sensing and GIS uh, applications or tools are available, and it makes uh, the user uh, friendly environment to generate a final output. So uh, one such example is we tsunami uh, vulnerability can be carried out based on the uh, two approaches. One is a kind of a uh, deterministic approach. Another one is a uh, uh, probabilistic or a kind of a holistic approach. This is a kind of an uh, 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 data sets we are using for the deterministic approach for inundation modeling that was uh, uh, is uh, covering in the next presentation, I just have a glimpse. What is the data set which goes in? So we have high resolution topographic data drawn from the ALTM, airborne radar terrain mapping, 
Autosat DM and various other sources as well. We combine all this data. And in addition to that, we also have bathymetric. We merge all these data sets and we generate a, a data grid that will be used for the inundation modeling to simulate the tsunamis, storm surges, and various other coastal circulation models as well. So these are the scenarios which we used for the uh, carrying out the tsunami inundation modeling. And uh, this is an example of uh, a tsunami vulnerability map, which we carried out for the East Coast as well as Andaman Nicobar Highlands. So it will give us what is the uh, extent of inundation, what is the uh, tsunami wave heights recorded on the land, runoff heights. So this is how inundation maps will, uh, tsunami hazard maps will look like inundation map. So further, we will integrate various other geospatial data into this and generate a tsunami vulnerability map. So I will not go more detail into that. That uh, modeling part will be covered by Shivash Shivash Nivas in the next uh, presentation. So another example is a kind of a, uh, uh, coastal vulnerability to cyclones. We what we have done is we have taken a cyclone tracks from the uh, best track data, NOAA best track data, and calculated the what is the uh, uh, frequency uh, uh, of the cyclones along the Indian coast. So at the district level, we have come out with how many cyclones were. Uh, uh, Impacted uh, um, uh, landfall in each district over a period of 1842 to 2016, we carried out. And once we know the uh, uh, most vulnerable areas, we can set up an inundation model and we can run the storm surge inundations and we can uh, generate a storm surge hazard maps as well. This is an example for uh, uh, storm surge uh, inundation model. So then, uh, uh, see, we have established a tsunami warning system at Inkas. As part of that uh, vulnerability map, coastal vulnerability mapping is one of the work component. Uh, in that uh, perspective, we started looking at the sorry, started looking at the uh, uh, vulnerability uh, status of the Indian coast. We initially started with this project. This is a coastal vulnerability index. So this index will be uh, generated based on the seven input parameter: coastal geomorphology, elevation, coastal slope, shoreline change rate. Uh, sea level change rate means significant wave and tidal change. So each of these input parameters are derived either using these uh, input data uh, like remote sensing observation and modeling data what we used in this and uh, we generate give a kind of uh, risk rating kind of uh, uh, ranking for these input parameters. Suppose for coastal zones which are eroding at a higher rate we have given high uh, uh, ranking and coasts are erod uh, creating are given low uh, rank and similarly, uh, low elevation or higher uh, given higher ranks. Uh, once we have the ranking for all these input parameters, we derive an index for each of these postal structures based on this uh, equation. So those index values were converted into different vulnerability classes, very high, high, moderate, and low. So these maps will give us a kind of a regional scenario on which part of the coast which are going to be uh, vulnerable considering the implication of uh, future sea level rise. But we don't know what is the extent to which coastal zones are uh, suffering due to these disasters. So this atlas we have prepared in uh, 2012 and released in 2012. Uh, these maps are generated on only to 1 lakh scales for entire Indian coast, including Andaman, Nicobar and Lakshadweep Islands as well. So uh, to understand what is the extent of uh, these oceanogenic disasters on the coastal zones, we have come up with a coastal multi-hazard uh, uh, vulnerability assessment. Uh, and this is an approach which we use for that purpose. It has a uh, continuous sea level data, like uh, hourly data we have taken. Those data set will have a, a record of uh, historical events like storm surge, tsunamis, or coastal flooding, all those things. Whatever tide gases recorded, uh, uh, the events including astronomical tides. And uh, when we detide that uh, 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 coastal zones, we'll come to know what is the extreme water level for each of these coastal locations, and we calculated it in period. And that is the kind of an, uh, probabilistic inundation level for those uh, coastal zones. And in addition to that, we also incorporate uh, uh, coastal erosion based on the current trend. We predict kind of a uh, future shoreline position and combine these two information, and we'll also add sea level rise to this. So sea level rise, extreme water level, and coastal erosion. These three parameters were incorporated in this, and a kind of holistic map is prepared. You can see this is a uh, schematic illustration for this. Suppose shoreline in 1950 was here, and 2005 it is uh, current uh, this portion which is eroded till here. Future it is expected to erode till here. 
and if the particular area is experiencing an inundation level of 5 meter, the level will go up to 5 meter elevation level. This is a composite hazard line. The area between the uh, post and this composite hazard line is a multi hazard line. So, for this purpose, we have used LTM data, Cotto DM data, uh, Landsat, and other IRS data were also used for shoreline change assessment, and our tight gas hourly data used as well. So suppose how we calculate the uh, um, DM. Uh, DM is generated based on the aerial uh, ALTM. Uh, ALTM uh, LIDAR sensor is uh, on board uh, uh, aircraft and flown along the Indian coast and it is uh, uh, LIDAR uh, data was processed and a, a DM was generated. In addition to that, we also can generate the DM using the uh, stereo satellite stereo data as well. Uh, recently, a lot of uh, data is generated using drones as well. Uh, we will get high, very high resolution uh, digital elevation models as well. And you can also generate using the uh, vehicle mounted or uh, street um, uh, 360 degree monitoring cameras as well. <coughs> These are the important uh, uh, mapping techniques for the uh, uh, 3D mapping of the terrain as well as buildings will be carried out. <coughs> This is an, uh, just an example of how extreme water levels were calculated and how return periods are calculated. Suppose this is a uh, plot, you can see that this is a uh, sea level data, uh, blue one is observed one, uh, red is a predicted sea level. Once you subtract these two, you will get a residual. Residual will give the ex extra, extra extreme events which were recorded in the tide gas. Suppose this particular event, there is a three meters of event recorded in the tide gas. Such events recorded uh, will be extracted from entire uh, tide gas records for a period of uh, more than 100 years and we'll uh, plot them on a uh, uh, this curve to calculate the reduced variate. Once we know the reduced, var reduced variate, we'll fit into non-exceedance condition and the return period is calculated based on this uh, equation. To process this, all this sea level data, we are using SLRP2 uh, tools, which will be uh, very useful for uh, generating, uh, uh, predict, extracting a predicted values and calculated the uh, residuals. So, based on this, extreme motor levels uh, are calculated and their return periods also calculated for each of these tidal gas stations. So, these are the input parameters we have high resolution topography, extreme motor levels calculated using the tidal gas record, sea level change rate and shoreline change rate. All these parameters were synthesized in the GIS environment and we'll come out with a kind of synthetic hazard line, composite hazard line, which is a kind of an extent of these oceanogenic disasters uh, can impact on the coastal zones. The area between coast, uh, coast and the this composite hazard uh, line is a multi-hazard zone. So this is a multi-hazard uh, map of the Indian uh, coast, including Andaman Nicobar Island. These maps are uh, on only 24,000 scales were generated and an atlas has been prepared. So how these maps can be further uh, uh, improved or what additional information can be uh, integrated with this to uh, uh, make uh, these data sets more uh, useful. So this is an example of Kadalo region, this is a composite hazard line. And we know that these are the, what are the mapped in red is a hazard zone and uh, green are the uh, uh, highly elevated zones within the southern zones. We can also integrate uh, land use to this uh, particular <coughs> hazard zone and we can extract the roads network within that and uh, what all the buildings falling within these hazard zones and we can integrate all of them and uh, kind of make, make a kind of assessment what all the buildings which are falling in the hazard zones and uh, this will make us useful to generate a risk map like these are the risk areas. This will help the disaster managers to prioritize their actions during the disasters. And in addition to that, these roads also will be useful to select evacuation paths during the event. Once you know the uh, safe shelter, which is the uh, nearest route uh, uh, based on the road condition and width, you can also select an uh, uh, evacuation routes as well. So these. Um, maps and uh, products generated out of this uh, uh, project are very useful for the coastal uh, disaster management. Considering this application, uh, we have developed a uh, 3DGS uh, mapping for the, uh, these uh, locations like uh, uh, Puri, Kakinada, Machli Patnam, Nizam Patnam, Chennai, Kadalur, Pondicherry, Rameshwaram, Tuti Korin, Kochi and Alape. So these are the coastal areas we selected for the setting up of the 3D 
GIS maps. So 3D GIS maps comprise of the kind of a city model. Uh, uh, individual buildings are mapped with their realistic textures on the roadside. And uh, each of these buildings were surveyed with what is the uh, kind of building and how many people are residing in it. This for uh, my map. This is in, uh, just a snapshot of uh, Machili Patnam area. Uh, these buildings are kind of LOD buildings. What we will do means uh, these uh, building sites are generated based on the stereo data and uh, uh, UAV data. And uh, once you know the uh, building bases are extracted from high resolution satellite and heights were derived using the stereo data. And we will generate a kind of building blocks based on their heights and realistic, realistic structure uh, was uh, pasted based on the 360 degree camera run along the street. <coughs> Once the survey, a socioeconomic survey is carried out, door to door survey, and the corresponding attributes were also attached to uh, the uh, uh, corresponding building. So, this is a snapshot of uh, Machili Patnam close look. And you can see that uh, textures on the uh, building is a realistic textures uh, of corresponding building. And this is a Pondicherry uh, as you view from the beach. So, and you can see that these are the attributes which are associated with these buildings. The attributes is nothing but the, it tells us the what is the uh, quality of the building, what is the uh, 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 kind of building, like what is the floor type, how many floors are there, mm, what is the foundation, wall type, roof type. Uh, and uh, uh, these are the parameters regarding the building. And in addition to that, we will also have a uh, sense, uh, uh, census on how many people are residing in this building and uh, male, female, uh, senior and children. Because senior and children are more uh, vulnerable age group during a disaster. So the buildings which are associated with more children and seniors are under high risk. So that's the reason we these parameters were also collected. And this is another example of uh, Machili Patnam area. And uh, this application also can run the tsunami inundation models as well. So we can simulate the inundation models, uh, which are set up in the uh, high performance computing system. Once the model is run, we can fetch that results and overlay on this uh, uh, application. Uh, sorry, uh, application. And we can calculate what is the inundation depth at each building, like runoff heights at each uh, doorstep. And based on that uh, 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 run of heights and the socioeconomic data available at each building, we calculate a kind of a risk, uh, socioeconomic vulnerability risk due to tsunamis can be generated. And uh, based on this, you can make out what are the buildings which are under high risk, moderate risk, and low risk. So this uh, kindly gives us a very micro level information for the disaster managers to take appropriate uh, action or uh, evacuation plans and other uh, uh, activity as well. This is another example of snapshot. And in a nutshell, these are the components of uh, 3DGS uh, applica 3D visualization application, which simulate the tsunami waves, calculate the flow depth at each building and the extent of inundation. And based on that, it will calculate the uh, risk at each building level. And these maps can be shared to the disaster managers through KML and other WebGIS uh, interface to them. And uh, in addition to that, we can also give extent of inundation along with our advisories. This is the end use of this application. So in addition to that, so now we know that uh, uh, in a specific to scenario we have carried out. We know that multi-hazard zones are kind of a physical vulnerability of coastal zones, which are exposed to these oceanogenic uh, hazards. <coughs> So once we know that uh, extent of uh, hazard zones, uh, we also uh, downloaded uh, villages which are falling in that uh, multi-hazard zones and uh, how many villages are experiencing this uh, uh, inundation or hazard zones and uh, what is their percentages for also calculated. This is a kind of uh, physical vulnerability at each village level. So we, we went to one step ahead. We also could uh, consider the socioeconomic uh, parameters like uh, sensitivity and adaptive capacity parameters derived from the national repositories of census data, agriculture census, population census, and health census data. All these data were derived into a village level uh, data. Once we know these uh, 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 parameters, we have generated a kind of uh, vulnerability framework, uh, which can uh, generate a socioeconomic vulnerability index at each village. 
So you can see that this is a sensitivity index, rapid capacity index, and this is a uh, social economic vulnerability index. So to generate social economic vulnerability index, we have sensitivity, uh, uh, we have uh, se social sensitivity, social economic sensitivity, and uh, adaptive capacity social and uh, uh, economic adaptive capacity. These are the parameters, 33 indicator parameters were derived. And uh, village level socioeconomic vulnerability index has been uh, generated. Once we have, this is a part of uh, Sindhudurg district. And once we have uh, this uh, socioeconomic vulnerability uh, index, we can generate a decision matrix at a district level or village level. Within that, how many villages are uh, vulnerable? You can see that this is a uh, Cartesian coordinate, uh, it's a four quadrants. So the villages, e each dot is a village. And size of this uh, uh, dot is a kind of uh, uh, population density. And this color is a uh, vulnerability. This orange is more vulnerable, green is less vulnerable. So you can see that within that, how many villages are falling in this uh, uh, vulnerable quadrant. And uh, if you click on that particular village, it will throw up the vegan mail. What are the governing parameters, social and economic, uh, so, uh, social and uh, sensitive and adaptive capacity parameters, which makes this particular village vulnerable. Suppose this particular village is a distance to town and uh, health lacking, uh, 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 um, this is far away from the uh, town and health facility is lacking and uh, literacy rate is less. And what are the parameters which makes this particular village just seems more vulnerable? This will help the policy makers to take appropriate uh, intervention policies uh, specific to the each village. Instead of going at a broader or a regional level planning, it will help us to make a village level planning because uh, we have a village is the smallest administrative unit as per the Panchayat Raj. And, uh, uh, the uh, village level uh, uh, developments are more appropriate to uh, develop a uh, 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 coastal environment uh, to make resilient against it. This is a kind of bottom-up approach. Once you identify which are the villages vulnerable, what are the reasons, then you make uh, strengthen them or uh, enhance their uh, resilience capacities. So this is an another example. Uh, earlier we went up to village level. This is an uh, 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 quarry. Uh, we went up to fisheries community as well, individual communities who are uh, uh, sent, um, uh, carried out survey and based on their socioeconomic conditions, we come out with a uh, socioeconomic vulnerability at individual fishing uh, uh, communities as well. So here we have used 54 indicator parameters and we also recommended what kind of uh, uh, intervention measures, alternate uh, livelihoods, yeah, uh, uh, also listed out in the particular uh, publication and those will be very useful for the uh, policy makers or uh, governments to take appropriate intervention uh, measures and alternate uh, livelihood plans as well. All this uh, uh, data which we generated uh, uh, this uh, project are uh, giving uh, contributing to the our national initiative like national coastal mission and uh, which is uh, focused on uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation uh, uh, as well. And it also helps in uh, prevention and mitigation of the hazards. And uh, it also uh, provide inputs to the national initiatives such as uh, National Action Plan on Climate Change, ICZMP, National Coastal, Coastal Mission, and the recent Prime Minister's 10-point uh, agenda on disaster risk reduction. So the global initiative, also, it contributes like uh, Sendai Framework, uh, Sustainable uh, Development Goals, and William Development Goals, which are primary focus on the strengthening the coastal villages against the uh, strengthening the community against the disasters. So, uh, another activity which we carried out is marine GPO. Earlier, I was telling that marine GPOs are uh, uh, increasing. As a result of that, uh, coastal uh, uh, marine uh, ecosystem like corals are getting bleached as well. This is one such uh, uh, case study we carried out. We can see that uh, what are the uh, marine detail uh, generated in the Indian Ocean, what is that intensity? And based on that intensity, what is the percentage of coral bleaching that can possible? We have just established a relation. And uh, this is a kind of case study carried out. And these are the uh, uh, events over a period of uh, 1900 to 2020, what are the marine detail events were recorded? You can see that over a period, there is an increase of marine heat event. 
so before that i want to say what is the marine heat wave so marine heat wave is a kind of uh, elevated uh, uh, sea surface temperature persist for uh, more than 5 days so that's the kind of an uh, uh, generic uh, uh, definition for your understanding engine so these marine heat waves will also play vital role in the genesis and uh, genesis of cyclones as well in addition to that it has a lot of adverse impact on our uh, uh, marine ecosystems like coral reefs and other uh, things so remote sensing and uh, uh, gs uh, gs tools will provide vital uh, uh, opportunity for us to understand such phenomena or implications or impacts of uh, this climate change or uh, disasters uh, for the coastal environs and ecosystems uh, along the Indian coast. So the, with this, we have also started um, coral bleaching uh, alerts. What is a bleaching? This bleaching is a kind of uh, 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 coral environments are under a severe uh, stress condition, uh, which is not uh, favorable for them. So this mainly happens due to increase in the temperature. So coral is a kind of an, uh, a polyp, it's an uh, animal, and it hosts an uh, zooxanthellae algae. When the temperature rises or any uh, unfavorable conditions are there, that zooxanthellae will come out of the uh, host coral, and that coral get bleached. So if that zooxanthellae doesn't turn back, to return back to the host, that coral will get died. So without zooxanthellae, corals cannot survive. This elevated temperature, pollution, and other parameters will make uh, uh, the coral environment uh, more unfavorable, and uh, that leads to a bleaching. So, the sea surface temperature based closer coral bleaching alert systems we have initiated at INFAS. We have conducted various case studies in the Andaman and uh, Gulf of uh, Mannar areas. Uh, after that, we are providing these data products on our website routinely. So, with this, I will uh, uh, stop my presentation. Uh, if you have any queries, please let me know. Sir, thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, a wonderful presentation and uh, phone speeding about like uh, uh, coastal vulnerability mapping and multi hazard mapping. Sir, uh, can you give me one minute uh, so we can have a questions from the participants? Yeah. yeah. Dear participants, if you have any questions, please put in the ch chat box or uh, question and answer section. Sir, as of now, I am not seeing any questions from the audience. Yeah. So on, on, on behalf of uh, NIDM and participants, uh, I could like to convey my sincere thanks to you for taking time for us to deliver a training session on coastal multi hazard vulnerability assessment and prospects of inquiries. And uh, I know personally your contribution to the this atlas. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for joining with us. Yeah. Thank you, Gautam. I'll share my yes, uh, system. Sure, sir. Uh, Shivas, Dr. will talk on the tsunami, exclusive tsunami inundation modeling, expert in the inundation modeling. So you did all that. So participants, uh, yeah, uh, good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon, sir. Uh, we have a yeah. 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 Actually, we have one question is there for the minder, sir. Yeah, I can, uh, you can answer. You can also answer. You can also answer it. No, no. Uh, it, 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 it would be better if uh, minder sir answers it. Yeah, I, I'll give it back to him, sir. Question, sir. Yeah, tell me, Gautam. Sir, what and how was the interference in Assam tsunami? Sir, question, question. So I, I didn't get your question. Can you repeat? What and how was the interference in the Assam tsunami? Japan, huh? Assam, Assam, Assam. He can Assam. Assam tsunami. Huh. No, no. Assam is what? Assam is state right you can see in the chat box is like uh, uh this not question is not related okay what and how sir, was the interference in assam tsunami sir. assam is not a coast maritime state right yes. assam yes, is sir, as, is see, assam as i understand it is having a threat from the uh kind of an uh, uh seismic activity like uh, earthquakes can occur and uh, landslides these are the uh, uh landslides and in addition to the floods also there 
Tsunami, I don't think it will impact uh, the Assam. Uh, it is a landlocked uh, state. Uh, it is not a maritime state. So yes, tsunami, is, tsunami is only the pertaining to the coastal zones. So yes, sir. I know, I know, I know. But uh, still, the participants of the course have to take out. Yeah, yeah no problem. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. We can have questions in the end also. No problem. Okay, sir. Sure, sir. Sure. Yeah, sir. yeah, yeah. I'll give it to Sivas Okay, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sir. Sir, good afternoon, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I apologize. My sincere apologies for the mess in the morning, 11 o'clock. So suddenly my PC gave hand. I don't know. It was hanging in the room. So uh, I rushed to uh, Mahindra, sir. And uh, thanks to him for sharing his PC. Um, Thank you, sir. Let me share uh, my so, PPT. Yeah, sir. Uh, dear participants, in, uh, without trade, we're going to our uh, second technical session. So I'd like to introduce our uh, second speaker to our audience, Dr. Shiva Srinivas, an uh, experienced scientist with a demonstrated history of working in the finite element, molding of uh, structures and fluids, skilled in uh, research and development, mathematical molding, electric programming, MATLAB and mathematical and physical research. Strong research professional with a massive focus on physics from Osmani University and pursued his PhD from Indira Gandhi Center for Automatic Research. Uh, so with this, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Shivashin Yeah, I'm sharing screen. Uh, just you can share the screen. Yeah, you can see the screen. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, okay. so uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Hope my uh, screen is visible. Yes, sir. Slide show. So, when you're going, yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is Sivas uh, Srinivas. I work in the Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services. I work on uh, numerical modeling of uh, uh, tsunami and uh, storm surges. So here, like, I, I would like to give a, a small glimpse or brief presentation on how we numerically model uh, tsunami here in Inquest to mitigate the uh, disaster of tsunami. So my outline would be, uh, I'll give a, a very basic general introduction, like uh, what a tsunami is and uh, why only numerical uh, modeling is required for tsunami. And then I get back to uh, what we do for tsunami in coins. Now, uh, I would like to give a quick, very small example or experiment. Uh, see, uh, okay. sorry, uh, as I've changed the PC, uh, I'm, I'm unable to play the video. So I would like to quickly give an introduction. Uh, this is a, a cubicle tank filled with water. And uh, this is a, a shake table where I can create artificial earthquakes. Now imagine that there is an earthquake uh, uh, at the bottom. Then this free trunk will uh, oscillate and the free surface of the fluid will uh, vibrate. When it vibrates, the height of the uh, tank will keep on increasing. Here it's a plot of uh, time series uh, versus height. So when there is an earthquake, the free surface, there will be oscillations. It keep on uh, uh, increasing. The height keeps on increasing depending on the frequency of the earthquake. If the frequency of the uh, earthquake is close to the if the frequency of the earthquake is close to the uh, frequency of the tank or the natural uh, frequency of the free surface, then I can see a increased uh, increase in the height so that the water will slosh out, it will come out of the tank. If there is mismatch in the frequency, if the frequency of the earthquake is not closer to the uh, frequency of the tank or the frequency of the free surface, then there won't be any uh, increase in the height. So this kind of phenomenon is called as sloshing. Now, why I would like to uh, give this example is, now imagine uh, this tank is a, a finite tank. Maybe its dimensions are one meter cross one meter cross one meter. Now imagine the walls are uh, infinite. There is a huge uh, distance, uh, thousands of kilometers between these walls. And imagine the depth is really uh, in kilometers. Then this will give you give us a, a real representation of an ocean. Now imagine at the sea bottom there is an earthquake. So this earthquake will transfer tremendous or uh, huge amount of energy to the free surface. And the free surface takes the huge amount of energy and it will deform. The height of the uh, undisturbed free surface will rise 
and under the gravity this free surface will uh, flow towards the uh, coast so this is the uh, real cause of uh, tsunami so the small example will uh, give us the uh, significance of tsunami or it, it, we can relate this to uh, tsunami now when i calculate uh, uh, such wave heights when i want to calculate whether the free surface is stable or not uh, this particular phenomenon is governed by uh, some set of uh, physical, physical laws and conservation of energies. When I apply those physics laws and conservation of energies, I'll end up with some uh, uh, set of differential equations which are uh, shown here. So I have different boundary conditions, uh, the amplitude or excitation of the earthquake, different boundary conditions and the fluid, fluid surface, fluid free surface rising to some height. So I'll end up with set of governing equations. If I solve these set of governing equations, then I can find out whether my free surface is stable or not. So whenever uh, we are studying any physical event, the physical event or physical phenomenon is uh, governed by a uh, set of physics laws, conservation of energy laws, Newton's laws, etc. We end up with the governing equations. And to study the system, uh, we are supposed to solve these uh, governing equations. So likewise, when we have a tsunami, uh, we have uh, uh, a physics laws governing it. We have an earthquake imparting huge energy on the free surface. It is governed by set of laws. We end up with a set of governing differential equations, ordinary differential equations, or uh, partial differential equations. And uh, to study uh, which uh, part of the coast is stable, which part of the coast is going to get high uh, wave height, which part of the coast gets inundated, we need to solve these equations to calculate the wave height. So how we are going to uh, by how we are going to uh, solve this uh, learning equations. So I would like to uh, show a video which is not being played in this, but I, I'll play it here. So how earthquake causes uh, a tsunami. So at the sea uh, bottom, uh, uh, we have subduction zone or huge rocks, uh, which can uh, which are prone to earthquake. When these move uh, vertically upwards, they impart a huge amount of energy to the free surface, and the free surface will uh, propagate towards the coast. So here, uh, what I would like to highlight is uh, this tsunami uh, consists of uh, three different uh, uh, three different steps. First, an earthquake has to occur on the uh, sea bottom or in the sea bed. So the occurrence of earthquake, we call it as uh, uh, generation. So here, an earthquake has generated. That is step one. And uh, this earthquake gives huge amount of energy or it will push the free surface of the water. Uh, the water will get deformed. We call this as deformation. And this deformation under acceleration due to gravity, it will flow towards the coast with certain height. We call this as propagation. After uh, this wave gets propagated, the water, uh, the tsunami water, the ocean water will enter into the uh, land and it causes inundation. So we have uh, three mechanisms here. First, generation of an earthquake. First, uh, generation of an earthquake, it's called generation. And the earthquake imparts uh, energy to the free surface. The free surface gets deformed. We call this as a deformation step. And under acceleration uh, due to gravity, the raised sea level water will propagate towards the coast. We call this as propagation. Once the water enters the coast, it will cross the land and it will inundate or flood the land. We call this as uh, inundation. So we have the step generation, propagation, and inundation. So uh, just now, uh, as we discussed, every uh, physical event or physical phenomenon will be governed by set of differential equations. Likewise, tsunami is also governed by set of differential equations. Our aim is, here is to calculate the uh, wave heights and to what extent the water has inundated the land. So my interest is to calculate the wave height. So to calculate the wave height, we are supposed to solve the governing differential equations. To solve these governing differential equations, uh, we have uh, uh, three different methods like analytical solutions or conduct an experiment or have real-time observations and solve it numerically. 
Now, coming about analytical solutions, if I uh, speak of uh, solving the tsunami equations using analytically, it's a huge domain and equations are highly nonlinear. So analytical solution is uh, ruled out. We cannot solve it analytically. Of course, yes, experiments are ruled out. In coming, coming about observations, uh, as in the tsunami, we have very short response time. We cannot wait for the observations to show what we might uh, we are going to have or what part of the land is going to get inundated because the observations are in the real time we cannot they cannot uh, give us in the prior they cannot give us observations two to three uh, within the uh, response time so even experiments or observations are ruled out so the other approach which is uh, uh, possible is numerical method so uh, you, you applying the physics laws we solve the uh, set of differential equations. We calculate the wave heights. We forecast uh, tsunami or forecast the wave heights using the numerical methods. A numerical method is nothing but solving a set of differential equations. So like uh, uh, in case of sloshing, uh, 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 now the video is being played. Uh, we have a set of uh, uh, differential equations here. So uh, numerical methods are nothing but we are going to solve these set of differential equations for the unknown parameter here, phi. In case of tsunami, we'll solve the set of differential equations for the wave height h. So numerical methods are nothing but way of solving differential equations to seek wave heights. So now uh, in numerical methods, we have uh, various uh, methods to solve it. Uh, numerical methods uh, vary depending on the accuracy you want and uh, depending on how what computational capability you have and what coding capacity we have so various numerical methods possible are finite difference method uh, fdm which is uh, very basic and finite element method fem uh, which is uh, one step above the finite difference method and uh, highly popular and gives us accurate solution finite volume method uh, machines methods highly nonlinear take a lot of time it's not used in case of tsunamis finite particle method and monte carlo methods etc so to summarize uh, in real time we cannot use analytical solution or observations to forecast a tsunami so numerical methods are the sole dependency numerical method is nothing but we are solving a differential equation to forecast the wave heights so numerical methods like finite difference method and finite element methods are being used now when i say a numerical method any numerical method will consist of uh, three different uh, steps the first step would be a uh, pre-processing step the second step would be mathematical uh, solution and the fourth step would be uh, third step would be uh, post-processing so any numerical method which is a way of solving differential equations uh, dep depends on three different uh, it has three different steps pre-processing uh, mathematical part mathematical solver and mathematical solution and post-processing now what is this uh, pre-processing uh, pre-processing in the sense now say i have uh, a specific region say indian ocean uh, and Bay of Bengal. In the Bay of Bengal, uh, I have an earthquake prone area, which is a Sumatra subduction zone. Now I have an earthquake uh, in the Sumatra subduction zone. Now I want to find out, will this earthquake cause tsunami? To what domain it will, uh, it will affect? So I need to select my domain of interest. I need to select my uh, region. I need to select my uh, uh, region. So selecting the region and meshing it considering various locations uh, forming a mesh uh, picking up the data required for the domain all these comes under pre-processing so meshing part considering what uh, what areas are of our interest and considering a domain uh, all these comes under pre-processing now once a domain is fixed once our regions of interest are, are fixed uh, then we have the mathematical part this mathematical part solves the uh, differential equations of tsunami using numerical methods, FDMR, FEM, etc. So uh, mostly we solve uh, these four kinds of uh, equations. This is a static equation. This is an eigenvalue equation. It is an eigenvalue equation. And this is a time dependent equation. So we solve uh, this kind of equations in case of tsunami. So once we have our wave heights, once we have solved the uh, differential equations, next we need to uh, visualize or we need to analyze the results. So visualizing the results, analyzing the results, which part is most affected, which part of the uh, region, which part of the domain, considered domain, will give us more wave heights. All these comes under post-processing. So to summarize, uh, we have three different steps in the new methods, pre-processing, uh, mathematical solution, and post-processing. So to solve the set of differential equations, to carry out any numerical methods, we need uh, a good computational capacity. We need uh, software for this. 
So various softwares are available in the market. We use uh, here we, in Incoys, we use various softwares. We have very basic softwares like C, C++, Photon, Python, R, Julia, uh, Mathematica, and uh, Hi-Fi uh, softwares like MATLAB, Octave, and Seller. There are also commercial softwares like Abacus, Ansys, Castum, Fluid, and OpenFoam. So all these softwares can be used to solve the uh, differential equations, to carry out the numerical uh, methods. Now, these are the programming languages. In these programming languages, you are supposed to write your own program for the numerical method. Whereas these are the commercial packages, uh, you will have uh, ready-made available libraries. Uh, you can do, you can follow up some steps and you can uh, do your numerical modeling in this. So all this comes under, uh, all this uh, comes under GUI. Uh, we have a graphical user interface for this. Whereas for this, uh, we have an editor, we need to code, we need to uh, program the numerical methods. Uh, uh, coming about, uh, uh, so uh, this is the uh, first outline which I have covered, why numerical methods and uh, uh, what we do in the numerical methods, what are different platforms used to solve different, uh, what are different plas pla uh, platforms to solve the uh, numerical methods or to have the differential equations. Now, uh, com coming back to uh, Tsunami, here we, in Coins, we have an uh, early tsunami warning center. So we observe uh, the subduction zones or earthquake prone areas around the clock 24 cross 7. My colleagues, uh, uh, they spend their time for 24 hours in shift basis and they monitor for any tsunami genic earthquakes. So mostly uh, we have uh, seen a video. Tsunami, 70 to 80% of the tsunamis are caused by the earthquake at the seabed. So here uh, we have a calm sea level and we have a sea bottom. So there is no disturbance on the free surface. Suddenly at time t is equal to zero, there is an earthquake at the seabed. So the earthquake has the earthquake will impart some energy uh, to the sea surface. The sea surface will take this energy and it will deform. The height will suddenly rise exactly at the top of the uh, top of the ocean place where earthquake has occurred. The free surface will rise if you take some height. So under the uh, gravity, the free surface, this free surface will propagate towards the coast. So it will propagate towards the coast. It's called a propagation and it will cause the inundation. So after a certain time, after some infinite time, when there is no any further earthquake, uh, when the seabed is calm, the uh, sea surface comes to no disturbance. So uh, these are the different uh, steps involved in the tsunami. Uh, as I said, uh, earthquake has occurred. This is generation. The free surface will rise. It is called a deformation. The free surface will propagate towards the coast. We call it as propagation. It will enter into the land, causing inundation. So generation, propagation, and inundation. Three different steps. So as I mentioned here, we have generation, propagation, runup, or inundation. Inundation, other synonym for inundation is uh, runup. Now, uh, most of the tsunamis, 70 to 80% of the tsunamis are uh, caused by earthquakes. Uh, there is a, a chance of uh, tsunamis by landslides. So a huge amount of land, uh, which is at the sea, has slided into the ocean. So this huge uh, block of uh, land will create a disturbance on the free surface and it will propagate towards the coast. Now, external, uh, there might be uh, volcanoes at the seabed and there might be a sudden volcanic eruption. So when volcanoes erupt, they will create some disturbance on the free surface and the free surface will propagate towards the coast. So here the generation mechanism would be uh, volcanoes. But there can be huge uh, uh, meteoroids which are uh, falling from external terrestrial areas, uh, very uh, rare case. If these blocks are huge, they will uh, fall onto the ocean, they will displace some amount of water, they will create uh, disturbance on the free surface and the free surface will propagate towards the coast causing propagation and inundation. So these are uh, various uh, different mechanisms where uh, tsunamis can be caused or occurred. So in uh, in COIS, we mostly observe for the earthquakes. So presently we are dealing with uh, earthquakes caused by the tsunamis caused by the earthquakes. So uh, off late, uh, recently we have started uh, uh, research on uh, how we can uh, observe or how we can tackle earthquakes due to landslides and volcanic explosions. Uh, this is under research. There's a lot of scope uh, for research in the landslide uh, tsunami earthquakes and volcanic uh, explosion of tsunamis. So uh, coming about uh, typical characteristics of the tsunami, uh, as I said, we have again uh, generation here. Uh, there is an earthquake. Earthquake has generated. Uh, 
this earthquake will impart some energy and the free surface will rise it will propagate towards the coast so generation propagation and inundation now there are some characteristics of the uh, tsunami in the deep ocean uh, i have a, a large depth so in the deep ocean my tsunami speed so when i say tsunami it travels it's, it's a wave it's a long wave it travels with a, a certain speed in the deep ocean as the depth is high the speed of the tsunami wave will be uh, directly proportional to the depth it's like the more the depth the more the tsunami speed and the more the uh, wavelength of the tsunami all these are directly proportional the more the depth the more the tsunami speed the wide the tsunami wavelength is i mean the large the tsunami wavelength is as it propagates and when we are coming towards the coast the depth of the ocean gradually reduces so here it was 5500 meters depth my tsunami speed is 835 km per hour as i'm coming uh, close to the uh, coast my water depth depth of the ocean has reduced it came to 900 meters as the tsunami speed is directly proportional to depth as depth reduced here my speed should reduce so from 835 km per hour it has reduced to 340 km per hour and further when i come towards the coast my uh, depth, depth will further reduce it has come to 20 meters here so further the tsunami speed has dropped down to 50 km per hour so typical characteristics of tsunami are the more the depth the more the tsunami speed the more the wavelength is the, the longer the uh, wavelength of the wave is the less the depth is the reduced the speed is the less the tsunami speed and the less the wavelength so uh, in this course of time uh, we have a continuous uh, waves coming with the large speed and speed gradually reduces speed gradually reduces as a result uh, multiple uh, waves will pile up here and because of sudden because of a reduction in the depth and because of huge waves are piled up there will be a, a push kind of thing happens and uh, when this tsunami wave enters the coast it suddenly rises it height will be uh, rise to couple of meters it will enter into the land and cause inundation which is a point of concern so in case of tsunami modeling or uh, studying tsunami characteristics uh, typical parameters to understand are wavelength uh, which would be distance between uh, two uh, continuous troughs or crests wavelength would be large in the deep ocean and wavelength would be less it will be decreased uh, when we come to the coast and we have a uh, depth d uh, of the ocean and uh, above the depth when there is tsunami we have wave elevation eta so eta is the wave elevation from the uh, mean sea level uh, to what height the wave has raised and we have a distance uh, we have the height from crest to trough we call it as wave height and uh, when it enters into the land to what height it has raised uh, we call it as uh, uh, d water depth from the uh, land to what height this is called as depth d and from mean sea level at what height the land is to the point where tsunami wave has reached this height uh, we call it as wave run up and this distance we call it as inundation uh, length or inundation distance so uh, when we numerically model it our concentration would be on calculating the wave elevation eta or the wave height h and calculating the uh, depth d and the uh, run up and the distance so uh, these are the parameters which we target to calculate in the numerical modeling of tsunami. So uh, as just now uh, I, I said that every physical uh, phenomenon is governed by a set of differential equations. Oceans are also governed by a set of differential equations. They are Navier-Stokes equations. So uh, this gives us the, the uh, this is the conservation of mass equation. These three are the conservation of momentum equations. Now, in case of tsunami, I need not to uh, have solve the uh, parameters at the depth. I'm going to have wave height only at the free surface. So I'm not bothered about the circulation or what different aspects go on at the sea depth. So I reduce these three differential equations to these three dimensional equations into two dimensional by uh, integrating the equations with respect to z. So these four equations, strictly talking, these three momentum equations which are along x, y, and z can be just brought down to uh, two momentum equations along longitude or along x, along latitude or along y. 
So we need not to spend uh, uh, much time uh, solving three-dimensional model. These three momentum equations by time by depth integrating them will be dropped down to uh, two-dimensional equations. Uh, we call them as uh, shallow water equations. Uh, shallow, uh, the meaning of shallow is there is no much depth. The uh, literal English meaning of shallow is not much depth. So why we call these as shallow water equations is, uh, we say uh, tsunami is a very long wave. Its wavelength is huge. It's in uh, 500,800 kilometers. This wavelength, the, this uh, wavelength, uh, this uh, wavelength is much, much larger than the depth. I mean, the depth is literally negligible compared to the wavelength. That's why we call them shallow. And we use this kind of approximation and reduced, uh, reduce three, these three momentum equations into two equations to have uh, uh, co computational efficiency and approximation and good accuracy. Now, uh, in case of uh, India, these are the uh, subduction zones which can give us tsunami genetic earthquakes. Uh, one is in the Bay of Bengal near the Andaman, we call this as Sumatra subduction zone. And one is here at the Arabian Sea, we call this as Makran subduction zone. So mostly in Incois, we monitor uh, for earthquakes, this Sumatra subduction zone and the Makran subduction zone. So any earthquake, if the magnitude of any earthquake is greater than 6.5, then uh, we say that uh, there is a chance of uh, tsunami. This earthquake whose magnitude is 6.5 might trigger tsunami. So if the magnitude is less than 6.5, uh, we issue simply a bulletin uh, that uh, so-and-so location, there is an earthquake of so-and-so magnitude. If the magnitude is greater than 6.5, then uh, we need to launch the model. Uh, we have a tsunami earthquake generated. We need to go for the propagation. So we call the numerical models. We calculate the uh, propagation and we check for inundation and issue uh, bulletins, whether it's going to give a tsunami wave or not. At what locations, what the height is going to be. So uh, uh, th this is the uh, bonding center facility we have. So our colleagues work in uh, three different batches around the clock, 24 hours. Uh, we have uh, real-time satellite uh, observations to get the data. So we work 24-7 and monitor the uh, tsunami genetic earthquakes. So uh, not only uh, earthquake as miners are presented, uh, Incois does a lot of multiple activities, like uh, continuously uh, monitoring the wave heights to uh, issue uh, wave heights and uh, currents to Navy people and uh, potential fishing zones, etc. So we have multiple research activities. We have uh, multi-data. We share data with the academics, uh, multiple research activities are going on in course. Along with the Tsunami Early Warning Center, also we have Storm Surge Early Warning Center, where uh, we take a track uh, forecasting from IMD, we uh, run numerical models, and uh, we give uh, Storm Surge uh, forecasts. Now, these are the different uh, observations which are used for Tsunami and uh, Storm Surge validation. Uh, this, consists of, this consists of tide buoys, mood buoys, ADCPs, uh, uh, bottom buoys of BPRs, etc. Now, uh, when, when I solve uh, tsunami numerically, uh, uh, so uh, I need to either code it or I need to use uh, different numerical packages. So depending on the numerical methods, uh, these are the uh, different uh, uh, packages available to numerically modulate tsunami. So uh, in case of analytical solution, it's not possible, uh, ruled out. If uh, we want to apply finite difference method, then we have numerical uh, methods like commit, tsunami, and concord. If you want to use finite element method, we have numerical methods like Adsuk, Kasten to uh, numerically model or forecast a tsunami. If you want to use finite element, finite volume method, we have methods like Anuga, Open Form, and Fluent, etc. If you want to use mesh free methods, uh, we have numerical methods like uh, uh, SPH, smooth particle hydrodynamics. So uh, it's a typical, uh, uh, again, as I said, uh, everything is governed by differential equations. Tsunami is governed by uh, differential equations. They are uh, shallow water equations. So in numerical model, typically we are solving these shallow water equations. Now again, in this uh, two aspects will come into picture. First, uh, whether I'm going to calculate inundation or I'm going to calculate only wave heights. That means only uh, propagation. If you want to have only propagation, I can discard these nonlinear terms. Okay, uh, these are uh, nonlinear uh, terms. This term and uh, this term, uh, they are nonlinear uh, terms. I can discard these nonlinear terms. I can linearize and I can solve only uh, linear equations. Uh, uh, why? 
Why we have to discard these terms is I'm interested in only calculating the propagation. If I include even these terms, my uh, mathematical mathematics is going to be complex. My code is going to be complex. It is going to take a, a lot of time. So if my interest is only to calculate the wave heights, so I can leaderize and uh, uh, solve these uh, leaderized equations. Okay. And now, as I said, uh, just a second. Yeah, sorry, thank you. Uh, there is some other uh, echo here. Yeah, so uh, uh, we discussed that uh, uh, modeling of tsunami, we have three states generation, uh, propagation, run up, and inundation. And we are using a numerical method. So, numerical method has three steps pre processing, mathematical uh, solution part, and uh, in an, and post processing. So, what are the different uh, inputs uh, required for this uh, uh, tsunami? So, first is I need a good uh, bathymetry for propagation and uh, I need topography for inundation. So, just now, uh, my has uh, presented like how Incois uh, gathers topography data. So, we take use of that topography data. And for bathymetry, uh, we are using Zipco, an open source and uh, uh, free uh, open source available online. For bathymetry, we are using propagation data. For inundation, we have topography. And uh, the grid should be such that uh, the grid should cover the subduction zones. So just now we have seen that there is a tsunami genic subduction zone here, Sumatra subduction zone, and here Makran subduction zone. So my domain should be such that it should cover both the subduction zones or the subduction zone and all the regions are interest. Now, uh, once I have uh, this bathymetry, topography, and a uh, grid, there is an earthquake. So earthquake has generated. So earthquake is typically nothing but at what location there is an earthquake. So I have longitude, latitude, at what depth the earthquake has occurred, and it gives us the uh, magnitude. With this information, uh, we take uh, we, we need to have further uh, data to generate uh, data information. Like we need to know fault length, fault width, strike angle, dip angle, rake angle, and slip. So from live observations, we get longitude, latitude, depth, and uh, magnitude, MW of the earthquake. So using some formulas, using some uh, processing, from this data, we calculate fault length, fault width, strike angle, dip angle, rake angle, and slip. So all nine parameters are needed uh, to generate this uh, deformation. So once we have the deformation, it will propagate towards the coast. It will inundate the land. We call it as uh, inundation. Now, what's the outputs of the post-processing part? As I said, our interest is wave height. So at every grid point, what is the wave height? And what part of the region got inundated? So this inundation at every time step. This is what the, uh, we say in the numerical model. Now, it's a uh, finite difference mechanism. Uh, these are the different uh, nodal points on the ocean, on the domain of interest, which we consider. So at every point, we calculate uh, from these differential equations. So we calculate the wave elevation eta. And we calculate uh, this m and n. m and n is nothing but a wave velocity, u component and uh, v component. So typically, how the algorithm uh, goes is, how the algorithm goes is, uh, I have an earthquake. From the earthquake, I'll calculate these parameters. Uh, I will calculate the deformation. Deformation is nothing but uh, I have the fault parameters. Deformation is nothing but at a t is equal to zero, I have the wave heights. So I have the wave heights eta here. I will substitute this wave height eta in these equations. So these equations will give me m and n, nothing but uh, this u and uh, v. Once I know u and v, that is m and n, I'll substitute m and n here. For the next time step, I'll calculate eta. This eta, again, I'll substitute in these equations. I'll calculate uh, u comma v. So it's like a cycling process. If uh, the method is known for one single time step, it can be continued for the, uh, and for loop can be run. It can be continued for three hours, four hours, five hours, like this. So first we calculate, uh, it's an initial boundary value problem. 
we get the value of eta, substitute eta in these two equations, that is a conservative momentum equations. From the momentum equations, sign change value. Uh, from the momentum equations, uh, uh, we get uh, velocity u and v, substitute the velocity u and v here, get the eta and the loop continues. So this is how uh, numerical model runs. So here I have shown the algorithm. So pre-processing loop, generate the grids, there is an earthquake, so get the fault parameters. From these fault parameters, calculate the surface deformation. Surface deformation is at t is equal to zero. Now, generation part is over. From this wave height, calculate the velocities, u comma v. Apply the boundary conditions. Substitute these u comma v and get the wave height. Okay. Again, go back here. So this loop uh, keeps continuing until uh, we have run tsunami for stipulated uh, duration of time, three hours, four hours, five hours like this. Till the end of the time, this t and can be couple of hours and we save the output and our outputs are wave rates. Now, when we are solving this, you can see that uh, we are covering a huge uh, uh, region or huge area. So I'm going to end up with uh, many multiple thousands, millions of calculations. So when I do these thousands, millions of calculations on a single uh, processor computer, I cannot achieve the speed. I cannot uh, issue warnings. I cannot forecast within the stipulated uh, 15 minutes to 20 minutes of time. It will take years or months to forecast. So I need to uh, speed up the process. To speed up the process, I need to use multiple processes. When I use multiple processes, it comes under parallel computing. So we solve these numerical equations using parallel computing. For, for parallel computation, uh, INCOIS uh, has GP, GPUs and it also INCOIS has uh, high performance uh, com computing systems. So in real time, when there is an earthquake, we launch these numerical models in HPC, high performance computing systems, and we uh, solve uh, uh, these steps uh, in HPC, generate the uh, wave height, analyze it, and issue the bulletins. So parallel computing is must. In serial computing, if uh, one event, uh, a run of three hours, takes two to three months, in HPC, it will take two to three minutes. So there will be a huge difference between, uh, huge difference like difference between cheese and chalk. So it's a typical uh, uh, result of tsunami to display for December 26, 2004 tsunami. So we have run the numerical model using finite difference method for December 26, 2004 tsunami. So we all are aware that uh, India uh, got introduced to the term uh, tsunami in December 26, 2004. So uh, it's a typical, uh, there was this typical grid showing bathymetry. So uh, depths at different uh, parts of the ocean. And this is the initial deformation. There is an earthquake and the earthquake has lifted the wave to eight meters height. So here the free surface of the ocean has lifted to eight meters of height. So now this will propagate towards the coast. So these are the, uh, as I said, there will be an earthquake. We have multiple fault parameters. So these are the seismic fault parameters used to generate this deformation. So uh, it's a zoomed version of deformation showing a clear picture of height, eight meters. Now, uh, when we simply, so when we simply run a model, uh, we cannot uh, confidently say that my numerical model is correct. It is giving the true results. I need to validate the numerical model with observations. So uh, here, the final difference method, this propagation, observations have been compared. So uh, they are in quite a good uh, match. So we generate, uh, the output will go to the uh, GIS engine. Uh, we'll generate different plots, which are uh, uh, useful to access the uh, vulnerability or the threat. Uh, we call uh, this as a travel time contour. Each area gives us the time taken by the tsunami wave to travel. For example, if I pick Chennai, Chennai here is in uh, blue color, uh, somewhere here. So 180 minutes. So this, if there's an earthquake here for the tsunami wave to reach Chennai, it will take uh, uh, 180 minutes, means 60, 60 plus 20, so two and a half hours. So if there is an earthquake in Sumatra subduction zone, typically it will take two hours to two and a half hours to reach to Chennai coast. So at any given point, pick a point, we can tell at what time uh, tsunami wave will reach it. It's a travel time plot. And this gives the typical wave height after the tsunami event, at what location to what height the sea level has raised. Say I have picked up uh, this point, uh, Chennai again, 
at this point i have a red color a red color says greater than two meters are right so because of this december 26 2004 tsunami at chennai i have uh, greater than two meters height wave height so it's called as a, a wave height plot or directivity plot this uh, this will uh, show us uh, wave height at different locations with these threat maps with these travel time plots and the directivity plot which are obtained from the uh, numerical methods are analyzed and uh, bulletins are or warnings are issued uh, so here uh, this is a typical the algorithm which i showed here it's a typical finite difference algorithm uh, which we used to uh, use around last year or couple of years ago the, uh, there are multiple uh, drawbacks of this uh, finite difference method they are uh, time consuming and they are not uh, that accurate compared with the fem methods so off uh, we have switched to a different numerical method called as atsak we are using this atsak for storm surge forecasts so we have uh, migrated we have converted uh, we, we are using this atsak even for uh, tsunami simulations atsak again any numerical method solves set of equations so these are the equations solved by the atsak these are shallow water equations in the uh, Cartesian coordinates. These are the shallow water equations in the spherical coordinates. Same thing, uh, we have the initial elevation eta, we solve it, get the wave height h. Now there are huge advantages with the Hatsak. The advantages are, uh, Hatsak is highly validated, Hatsak is finite element uh, based method, and Hatsak is highly parallelized. Uh, parallelized in the sense, if this is a typical mesh covering uh, Bay of Bengal, uh, I can split this uh, mesh into small multiple chunks. Each chunk can be uh, sent to a different uh, uh, processor. Each chunk will be sent to a different processor and I can uh, speed up my computations. So Atsak is highly parallelized code. It's highly uh, robust. It is highly validated. So we have uh, switched on to Atsak for uh, tsunami forecast. So Atsak uses, uh, you, you can see a, a basic difference between a grid here. If you see this grid, it's like a, a square in shape. It's highly uh, structured. So we call this grid as a structured grid. So finite difference methods and most of the numerical methods, they work with uh, structured grids, which have some inherent uh, drawback with the uh, drawback with such grids. Whereas the exec uses uh, unstructured mesh. There are huge advantages with unstructured mesh. The advantages being uh, we just discussed that uh, the wavelength of the tsunami wave is larger in the deep ocean. When it comes to the coast, it gets coarser. Uh, it, it gets uh, uh, wavelength reduces. So instead of wasting my time with uh, resolution in the deep ocean, I can have a coarse mesh in the deep ocean. And when I'm coming towards the coast, I can refine. I can have a fine resolution. This saves my computational time. This gives me a lot of advantages. So this is the main benefit of the unstructured mesh, uh, unstructured the mesh or grid. Uh, you can see here the maximum grid spacing in the deep ocean here is around 10 kilometers. In the deep ocean, the grid spacing is 10 kilometers, the resolution. When I'm coming towards the coast, the grid spacing is 50 meters. So it will capture the characteristics of the tsunami. Now we have run December 26, 2004 uh, tsunami with uh, Atsark. Uh, it's a typical unstructured mesh generated uh, covering the complete uh, operational domain or the Indian Ocean. Uh, this gives a typical uh, bathymetry. In the regions of interest, uh, we have picked uh, data like SRTM, ARTM, etc. And this bathymetry has been mixed up with that, uh, merged with that. And this shows a typical uh, inundation grid. So uh, this is the coast. When we uh, cross the coast, the mesh becomes very fine so, so that it can capture uh, inundation. So this grid has around these many number of elements and these many number of nodes, 377,747. The maximum grid spacing at the deep ocean, at the deep ocean is around 20 kilometers. When I'm coming towards the coast, the resolution is 50 meters. Now, uh, 50 meters in the sense, I can uh, resolve the tsunami heights to a distance of 50 meters when wave enters into the coast. Uh, this is a typical uh, initial uh, deformation when there is an earthquake. I get the different uh, seismic fault parameters like latitude, longitude, depth, that's epicenter, dip, slip, rate, dislocation, length, and width. With this, I'll generate the initial deformation. So this is the initial deformation. So you can see that the sea surface has raised to a height of 8 meters. This will now propagate towards the coast. 
So these are the uh, propagation uh, propagation of uh, tsunami wave at different uh, time intervals. You can see at 30 minutes, uh, this part has been covered. For next one hour, uh, this part has been covered. So it will propagate towards the coast. After 12 hours, it has covered entire uh, uh, operational domain or entire domain. Again, as I said, we cannot blindly use any numerical method. Numerical method used should be validated with the observations to say that my numerical method is correct. So what I'm forecasting is true. It is giving uh, sensible values. It's not throwing any uh, garbage. So to, we need to validate the numerical method. So here uh, we have validated the numerical method with the uh, real-time uh, uh, observations at different locations like Kochi, Tutkirin, Chennai, uh, Tapanoi, Phuket, etc. Uh, we found that uh, the tsunami wave heights obtained from numerical methods and observations are uh, quite good in comparison. So the numerical method at CERC is giving sensible uh, values. So at the top left, I have showed the correlation and uh, root mean square error. So this says that uh, our uh, numerical methods are quite close to the observations and uh, we can trust the results. We can trust the results. Again, uh, this is a typical uh, travel time plot and the, this is the Directivity plot obtained from the ATSIC. Uh, this is the uh, inundation part. We know December 26, 2004, uh, the Kadalu region was highly uh, affected. So, this shows typical inundation. It's a Tamil Nadu, uh, Pondicherry, uh, various areas. And uh, uh, this is the Kadalu uh, region zoomed version. So, uh, this is zoomed here. So, you can see uh, the black shows the coastline. Tsunami has entered into the land and it is inundated. So this shows the inundation. So from here, the numerical method, I, I can go to GIS, I can drop, uh, I can calculate the distance normally here. I can get the inundation extent or inundation length or run up length from here. And numerical method gives me height straight away. So you can see uh, it is uh, blue in color here. I, it's around 1.5 to uh, 2 meters. So uh, here it is around three meters. So from these plots, I can straight away get the height. I can calculate the distance. I can get the run-up length or inundation distance or inundation extent. So from the products of the numerical methods, we can uh, get what we want. So it's a typical animation which shows the uh, propagation for the December 26, 2004 tsunami. So now it has reached uh, the Chennai coast. It has taken around uh, two hours, 15 minutes likewise. So with, with the time under gravity, when we solve uh, shallow water equations using numerical methods, the free surface wave will uh, propagate towards the coast. So this has been uh, solved using ATSERC. Uh, the simulation length was for 12 hours. So there is a December 26, 2004 tsunami and we have run the simulation for 12 hours. It has taken six minutes of time on HPC and we have used a 480 uh, processes. If I increase the processes, uh, time can be further reduced to three to four minutes, uh, which can uh, give us uh, time to issue bulletins and post-processing it all, which can save a lot of time. And here the center one uh, shows the propagation same, which was shown in the previous slide. In the top four plots uh, shows the inundation. So when wave hits the coast, you can see uh, like the water crosses and it inundates. Uh, here you can see it's giving a glimpse of inundation at uh, Karaikal, Nagapattam, Puducherry region. So uh, water has entered and it, it, it has inundated. Here uh, you can see uh, some parts of inundation in the Mahabalipuram. And here uh, we have uh, some inundation. So, so we can get propagation and inundation in a single stretch with unstructured wind. That's the advantage. And uh, Offit Incoys is also planning to give uh, 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 warnings or for the uh, international world domain when there is an earthquake. So we are trying to extend the, the ATSAC, the present uh, numerical uh, model to the world domain. So we are trying to prepare a mesh where with this mesh at any subduction zone, tsunami genic, tsunami prone genic uh, subduction zones, if we have earthquake, we will call this uh, mesh and uh, uh, calculate the tsunami wave rates and check uh, which part or which continent or which country is going to get affected. So this is under re uh, research. So soon, once this is successful, success will implement. Uh, we'll be implementing this as well in our uh, warning center. Yeah. 
So to, to, uh, to summarize, uh, what we have is uh, every physical uh, phenomenon will be governed by set of governing differential equations. Likewise, in tsunami, we have set up governing differential equations. They are shallow water equations. So we solve these shallow water equations using numerical methods. So uh, tsunami consists of, tsunamis are occurred by earthquakes, 70 to 80 percent are because of earthquakes. Uh, Inquis round the clock monitors these earthquakes. If magnitude is greater than 6.5, then we consider uh, those earthquakes, which is called generation, and uh, they it will uh, we will create a deformation on the free surface. And this deformation will propagate towards the coast called as propagation and it might inundate the land. For this, we use the uh, numerical methods. So, uh, generation, propagation, and inundation. With the help of uh, numerical methods, we can uh, issue timely warnings and uh, bulletins. Yeah, uh, that's what I have. Thank you. Any questions? Sir, thank you, sir. Thank you so much for uh, taking time for us to deliver a training session on numerical methods in extreme events like tsunamis. Sir, we will wait for one minute if we see any questions in the chat box. Yeah, sure, sure. Sir, on the behalf of NIDM and participants, I would like to convey my sincere thanks to you for taking time. Sir, as of now, there is no question, sir. Okay, sir. So thank you so much sir, for taking time. Yeah, thank you. It's my pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So, uh, dear participant, this is the end of our three days of online training program. Uh, before concluding our uh, OTP sessions, uh, I like to convey my sincere thanks to Sita Jason, IPS, ED, and Professor Suripata, sir, head Juma Division and Cyber and Industrial and Cyber Data Division, and idea Ministry of Public Government of India. And also my heartful thanks to uh, Director Inquis, as well as uh, Sri R.S. Manjar sir and Dr. Shiva Srinivasa and also other panel members and participants. A very special thanks to IT section of NITM who is working behind the curtains. Thank you all. Uh, thank you for all of you for joining with us today. Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.